Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar in this series. Hello, Jordan. Um, we are now going to be calling this the Concrete Conversations, and uh, we'll kind of be sitting more out about that in the weeks to come. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that we do record all of these sessions, so please reach out if you'd like a copy. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our, our presenter today, um, Michael. Michael um, started his professional career as a marketing analyst before founding an e-commerce focused digital marketing agency. Um, he spent a decade running that agency with clients including MailChimp, Atlanta United, Tyler Perry, <clears throat> um, and Atlanta-based businesses, Arden's Garden, Onward Reserve, and um, as some of y'all may know, he also worked with True Blurry Hair back in their early days. Um, so after that, he went on to lead marketing at Control Freak, an Atlanta-based video game accessories company. He's in the process now of starting his own e-commerce venture, and he also invests in and provides strategic guidance for early stage digitally focused companies. Today, um, he plans to give a little overview on how to think about structuring your marketing and budget as well as goals, um, you know, and how to evaluate costs. He'd love at the end an opportunity to chat through any specific examples y'all may have, scenarios, questions, et cetera. So, um, you know, please feel free to jump in, raise your hand, and I will unmute, unmute you. All right, take it away. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, so I'm going to do just that. I think I struggled putting this presentation together a little bit because there are so many different things you can consider with regard to digital advertising, digital marketing, and e-commerce, right? I didn't want to go super broad, but I also didn't want to go super narrow. So uh, the goal here is to try to give the right kind of uh, lens to digital advertising and give a really the bulk of this is going to focus around an example um the examples working with an influencer um who you know would potentially help market an e-commerce company um so that's that a uh, little agenda right we're going to do a background on digital advertising channels to consider i think as we were just sort of discussing before the call there are um zillions of channels right ways to spend your money online to market your business um and so we'll cover a few of those um, and then really the meat of this is just cross-channel evaluation criteria. So if you're comparing different options, how can you standardize it? How can you normalize it? And how can you make a decision on where to spend your marketing dollars? And then finally, the exercise I talked about walking through an example of working with an influencer. Um, so a little background on digital advertising. I think, um, you know, everybody's exposed to this by now and knows what it is, but um, I kind of want to walk you through the brief history of digital ads. So 1994, the early stages of the internet, uh, the first banner ad appeared. And for context, that banner ad had a 44% click-through rate. So 44% of people who saw it actually clicked on it. Today's banners get about a 0.06% click-through rate, right? So something I'll get into is just sort of quality versus quantity and banner ads have obviously kind of gone out of style. Uh, in 1999, the first paid search ad appeared. Uh, it was a sponsored result at the top of goto.com and it was a dollar per click. Google has obviously made, I don't know, billions if not trillions of dollars off of paid search ads since then. Uh, but that's when that really first started. In 2006, the first YouTube video ad showed up uh, as a pre-roll before a video on YouTube, right? And so that obviously replaced um, or started to replace what we were used to seeing in terms of advertising, which was TV commercials. In 2009, Facebook introduced the Pixel, right? So this was a piece of code you could actually put on your site to begin following people around the internet and retargeting them and doing a little bit more uh, fancy targeting with advertising. Um, and uh, that has obviously exploded since 2009. In 2010, the first native advertising showed up on sites like BuzzFeed and Mashable. Um, so they were producing um, content, right? They were writing articles and actually having brands and companies sponsor that content uh, and, and inserting advertising into that content in a little bit more of a uh, subtle and sleek way than just simply a banner advertisement. Uh, and then in 2016, this is really an important kind of milestone, mobile overtook desktop in terms of advertising spend. So advertisers were spending more for the first time on mobile ads instead of desktop ads. Uh, and that trend has only accelerated since then. And now I think, you know, over 80% of spend in terms of advertisements is consumed on mobile devices. 
Um, something I like to think about a lot with advertising and really with all marketing is this concept of the attention economy. Um, anyone who's seen any of these uh, Netflix documentaries on social media understands what the attention economy is. And it basically means that we are all as brands and as businesses constantly competing for our end users and consumers attention. Um, we're competing not only with other brands and our direct competitors, but we're competing with things like Netflix. We're competing with video game systems. We're competing with our kids and the, you know their attention that they need from us, right? So the goal of advertising is actually to get and keep consumers' attention, but there's only so much attention to go around. Um, and with that, you know, we've got a limited amount of time to get people's attention. So you got to have the most positive brand impressions and interactions. And the more of those positive impressions and interactions that you can have with a consumer, obviously the better for your brand. Uh, and it's important to think about that, right? Like who are you actually competing against, right? You're competing against other brands who are bidding on Facebook ads, but you're also competing against, you know, people who want to maybe spend their time on Pinterest or they want to, you know, again, go outside and play with their kids, um, competing with lots of different things. So you've got that sliver, that second, or that, you know, few seconds to actually make a brand impression when it comes to advertising. Um, with that said, right, quality versus quantity. I think it's really important to know that um, you have to get enough impressions of your company out there before it starts to make a result. I think thinking that you can start advertising and start to see a return immediately is a little bit foolish, right? You've got to commit to it. Um, and research shows that it takes 11 or more impressions for a brand to be recognized by a consumer. They've got to see your brand, your logo, your advertising 11 times before they start to take notice. Um, to that end, right, like cheap, low quality impressions are abundant. And I'm not saying that you need to just throw your logo or your banner ads everywhere, um, but it's an important kind of part to consider piece of the overall advertising strategy as you think about that, right? You, can you get brand impressions out there as part of an advertising strategy? The answer is yes. And those, those impressions are available, but they are again, low quality, right? You can't and shouldn't expect to get much of a return on them. The quality interactions are expensive, right? The ones where you actually know, okay, this person is likely to click on my ad and purchase my thing. Those are the expensive ones, but are also an important part of an overall kind of full funnel marketing strategy. And right, that rhetorical question is, which is better? The answer is both. And what I mean by that is, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here, um, a, you know, a, a well kind of mixed and sort of well thought out advertising strategy does both. It has those brand impressions at a high quantity, at a low cost at the top, and then it has those conversion focused impressions, those high quality but expensive impressions kind of here at the bottom, which do end up sort of in a direct click. Um, I tend to spend a lot of time and effort and energy thinking about the marketing funnel. Um, that's not necessarily where today's talk is going, but if you haven't really thought about your specific company's marketing funnel from that top you know, brand impression level all the way down through conversion. Um, that's really a great way to kind of consider what different ad campaigns and what kind of different marketing activities you have to address each phase in the funnel. It's really important also with advertising to set your intention. I think um, you should not spend a dollar without a very clear quantitative KPI in mind for each kind of campaign that you set out to um, set out to put out there in the universe, right? I think it's really tempting to look at how much money am I going to make from this specific ad? Um, and that's an okay thing to look at for the right campaign, um, but there's a lot beyond that. Just considering alternative KPIs for your advertising um, and also thinking about attribution, right? Like I may put something out there that is maybe even not digital, like a billboard, and I've got to figure out a way to think, how am I going to know what came back from that billboard? Um, if you don't have that information, if you aren't able to get that information, it's more of a wish. Um, it's more of a, you know, kind of winging it strategy than an actual strategy. Um, so having really set KPIs, set quantitative results in mind before you start is great. Um, and some of those KPIs can include things like ROAS, return on ad spend. That's obviously one that a lot of folks use, particularly when it comes to e-commerce and the, you know, the e-commerce return that you get from advertising. Um, you can also include impressions, right? The number of people that see your ad, number of clicks or sessions to your site, um, 
quality things like the amount of time that those people actually spend on your site or the bounce rate, how engaged with your website are they? Uh, the number of conversions, the number of people who actually buy something obviously is great. And then revenue. I mean, again, it all comes back to business and having a revenue goal in mind is great for those bottom funnel focused um, uh, campaigns. And then sort of a quick question is, Michael. yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, this is great. You're asking, I was going to stop and ask with everything you've presented so far, I was going to ask anyone in the room if they had a question, um, but maybe yeah. we'll start with your question. Yeah. The question is, do you have a target ROAS, right? Do you have KPIs set? Uh, and if so, I'd love to hear what, and if not, you know, maybe talk about how you can arrive at that. Anyone want to share? Does, does anyone know what ROAS is or does not know? Okay, great. Okay. I did not know. So I just, <laughs> but y'all are <laughs> much more legit. Um, anyone else on the line have a, um, uh, anything they'd like to share about a target ROAS or other KPIs they're working on? You can either put it in the chat box or raise your hand. I'll give the example. Um, we, at my previous company set an internal goal of 300% ROAS. So that meant that for every $1 we put out there in advertising, we expected or wanted to see $3 back in revenue. Now, obviously revenue is not um, profit, right? And so that's why it's three to one. You had to take the cost of goods sold. You had to take a, a handful of other expenses uh, to say that, you know, again, we were comfortable pushing forward and optimizing and, and spending on campaigns that returned about a three to one return on ad spend. Um, that didn't mean every campaign had a three to one, right? Some of them had a one to one or a two to one, um, but were very much uh, brand impression focused. And then some of them had a five to one or six to one. Um, so blending those all together, we had that 300% ROAS um, goal in mind, but we also did track these other metrics as well. And I think it's important to have a really keen and clear understanding of your metrics when it comes to digital advertising. Um, and again, that's the benefit of advertising digitally as opposed to with a billboard or in a newspaper ad. Michael, um, Bree has a quick question. Yes. Hey, Michael. So for ROAS, does ROAS almost fall on like a bell curve with the newness of your company? Like part of me feels like if you're just launching and no one knows about you, then, you know, even a one-to-one -one ROAS yeah. is positive just because you're getting out your brand. Whereas like, if you're, oh, here you go. You, you read my mind. Okay. <laughs> so I think it's really, yes, that is exactly right. It costs money to make money An established brand, somebody who's already maybe had those 11 or more brand impressions with a consumer doesn't need to spend on things that aren't going to generate a return so they can yield a significantly higher ROAS. If you are a new company, um, I think you view it as an investment, right? You say, I'm going to spend money now and it might take three to six months for me to actually see that return, um, but I have the confidence and I'm gonna stick with it um, to know that I'm gonna get you know, quality impressions over time um, and maybe set again for that first year or first you know, 18 months, a bit of a higher, um, Pro, your amount of projected sales in terms of my marketing budget. Um, you probably, as a growing and small brand, have other advantages to these larger brands in terms, in terms of other operating costs. So um, if you're looking at your overall P&L, right, your marketing budget is going to be a higher percentage of your sales, but it's not necessarily going to be um, something that is additive uh, or, or takes you over the hurdle because you haven't yet realized some of these other costs that these big brands may have to deal with. Um, and so just as a general rule of thumb, right, to that exact point, um, I would say that a growing brand can spend 12 or probably even up to 20% of projected sales in terms of advertising. Um, with a more established brand, right, like you look at your, um, your Proctors and Gambles and like, you know, the business school cases in terms of marketing as a percentage of sales, they'll probably tell you that 8 to 12% range is the right amount. But those are, are probably for more established businesses that um, have significantly more um, overhead and more brand uh, viability with their end consumers. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, you know, another, like I said, being in tune with your metrics, right? I used to 
reconcile monthly. I would actually reconcile like weekly, which isn't the best exercise because not all the con conversions have come trickling in, but um, reconciling your, your budget monthly to make sure you're on track, right? What did I spend on Google and Facebook and everything else this month? And what did it yield in terms of sales, both from directly from those ads and then as a percentage of the overall business um, that can kind of keep you on track and make sure that you're you know, in the right ballpark um, if you're not spending enough, if you're spending too much, um, you can kind of live month to month. I have an Excel tracker that I've used now for many different companies. If you'd like that tracker, I am more than happy to share it with you. Um, give me one second, I'm gonna mute these other notifications because you might hear my dinging. All right. Um, and with your marketing budget, right? Like what should be included in your marketing budget? It's obviously going to be things like production costs, video, photography, design work, et cetera, right? That's part of it. The advertising costs themselves definitely should go into it. Any marketing software tools that you're using. So, you know, your email service provider, your data tools, or, you know, any of the social media posting tools, those types of things all go in your marketing budget. What it does not or typically should not include is most people, and what I say most, it should not include full-time employees, but it should include things like a contractor that you use for a photo shoot um, or a videographer or something like that. So um, really, you know, take a look at your expenses and you can kind of say, yes, this is a marketing expense or no, it's not um, based off of if it is directly focused on marketing, advertising, and getting your brand out there. Any questions before I move on? Great. I'm going to get into a little bit to channels. Um, again, there are so many, um, but the golden rule that I've always kind of gone back to is to go where your customers already are. Um, you can't change their behavior. You can try, but you can't. Uh, so invest in channels where you know your customer already exists. Um, now this could be broad, right? Like Instagram, my, ch my customers live on Instagram. Well, that's great. But thinking even deeper than that, right? Is it feed versus stories versus reels, you know, versus IGTV? Um, is it, you know, something like Pinterest? Is it, you know, with your influencers that you might be working with, um, knowing that they're really a great fit for your audience, right? Mm -hmm. There is really some critical thinking that can go into what specifically can I do to get in front of my customers um, and to get where they already are? You know, in my, my days with Control Freak, uh, we coveted advertising on Twitch, the you know video game streaming platform, obviously for obvious reasons, right? People playing video games, people watching video games, it was a perfect fit. So um, go where they are. Don't try to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, it might be tempting because you might see lower costs on other channels, but you're going to obviously be much more effective if you go where they already are. Um, so digital channels right to think now. of. Yes. How, are there Sorry, ways to like? That's no, all good. Um, are there ways to like? Are, are there like tricks to try to think about, you know, where your customers may be, you know, looking or I, mean, I know that's like a vague question and a lot of it's trial and error, but like, if, especially for some of our companies, you know, here at Saltbox that are new and a lot of times their product is not something that's been done before. How do you know, like, you know, where to find the places that your customers are living? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, a vague and broad answer would be like, just do your consumer research. Um, you can poll existing customers. You can ask, literally ask your customers, like, how do you spend your time? What do you like to do? You know, what, what do you prefer Instagram stories versus Instagram reels? Um, another great way to do it would be to look where your competition is advertising, right? I think one of the things that I haven't covered here is that all of this advertising exists in sort of an open market and an open economy you're bidding for advertising impressions against other advertisers. And so the market can kind of actually tell you where you can or maybe should be spending your money. If you know of one, you know, maybe established brand that has the power to do the research and you know that they always appear on, I don't know, Instagram stories or Google search or Google shopping, um, that may indicate an opportunity for you. So I don't have like a great, cheating answer for that um but if you've got a feel yeah. for your customer you we have a cheat yeah. <clears throat> so 
Okay. Well, one, Can you introduce yourself for us? Oh, hey, it's uh, Omar Holland from uh, Last Couple Standing, uh, Sweet 19. Holla at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things we did early on was um, basically started a new Instagram feed and just went to our competitors' websites and got in a cart. Then they automatically, you know, their retargets come back and hit us so we get to see all of their um all their creative and how often they post you know we just get to see every we just learn everything about them will it fit what we're doing or not that's something you have to kind of go through and you know kind of pull away the weeds to discover yeah. but that's that's a that's a sneaky way okay, yeah. so it was like a business fin stuff a, no. a business what they call it a finsta, like a fake Instagram. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not like that yeah. Finsta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finsta, yes. Don't anybody else, but like for us, it's cards and humanity, what you mean, card yeah. tags, it's just a bunch of other uh, card games. Okay. And so we learned a no. lot about them. I, I love it. And I think, yeah, spying, right? Seeing what others are doing, the good, the bad, the ugly, that's all kind of part of doing the market also, research. And I think- Also, to, also yep. to add to that, we, um, we signed up for everybody's newsletter and um, what was, was something else? It was a newsletter with something else. But well, any, any competitors, we signed up for that newsletter. So we also get to see the inside, the email, the email, okay. emails of the drip, the drip campaign. So you kind of can spy that way too. So you're kind of getting both sides. You're getting the ad, advertising side, in which they're running, and you're getting the internal stuff, which they're sending out to their potential customers as well. So it's a double whammy on that. Yep. I think um, all those things, all the above, right? Get to know where your competition is spending. There are tools out there for literally spying on uh, on Google, right? I think because Google ads are such a wide open marketplace, you can actually start to get what they're spending, what their you know keywords they're targeting, and that kind of thing. Um, I am you know by no means a Google search engine marketing expert, but I do know that um, there are a handful of tools out there. I think one's called SpyFu and a few others that allow you to see um, specific keywords and budgets that you know potential competitors are, are spending. Um, cool, so going into digital channels a bit, again, this is a list, um, feel free to throw more out here, but I think you know the first one to talk about is Google. Um, and really four kind of key components of Google are search, right? Your search engine results, shopping, display, and then video via YouTube. Um, you know, when I, look at Google and I look at e-commerce, right? Shopping is obviously one that will have the highest return and tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, but the Google suite of advertising is uh, against probably Facebook, right? The, the most sophisticated and the one that allows you to scale the quickest because there are no minimums. It's a self-service platform. Um, and you can really get started um, you know, on day one purchasing uh, Google ads, keywords, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, Facebook, again, most sophisticated alongside Google. And obviously Facebook includes things like Instagram these days, as well as their other platforms. Um, you could get away with just spending on these two platforms and be fine. Um, there are a million other choices as we'll get into, but I think it's something like 80% of advertising dollars today are spent on one of these two platforms. Uh, and that's mind boggling considering the breadth and sort of availability of other uh, advertising platforms that do exist. Things like, you know, your other social media networks, Twitter, Pinterest, Reddit, um, they all are starting to have more self-service platforms, again, going towards the Facebook model. Amazon, um, I could talk all day about Amazon. This is not gonna be something we necessarily cover today, um, but alongside, you know, if you sell on Amazon, Amazon also does have a, uh, a platform for purchasing their advertising impressions for sites that Amazon owns. Um, so not necessarily just driving back towards Amazon shopping. Direct buys. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you have a website or a blog or a, you know, the editorial or news media site that you want to directly buy advertising impressions from them. A lot of these sites will sell that directly to you, uh, usually through an advertising rep, tends to be a little bit of a higher minimum, but it's another kind of flavor of uh, banner or in kind of in-feed advertising for some of these sites. Um, programmatic advertising, uh, this has kind of come in the last I don't know, four or five years um, to, to prominence. And this is sort of saying, okay, 
I'm going to let the computer decide where my advertising should go. And a lot of times in programmatic advertising, um, you can get some sophisticated targeting and some sophisticated consumption as well. Things like connected TVs, right? Um, again, one of the cool things we did with, with Control Freak was say, we want to purchase advertising impressions for people who are watching Hulu on an Xbox, right? So we know that they own an Xbox and go from there. Um, so you can start kind of start to get creative with things like that. Um, audio advertising, you know, maybe on Spotify or other platforms like that has become uh, significantly more relevant as well as podcast advertising. And this kind of starts to bridge over into uh, what we're going to get to talk about in a second, which is, you know, influencers and sort of um, sponsored media, right? Um, you as a brand can sponsor somebody who already has those impressions available to them. Uh, and this is becoming much more mainstream, um, significantly a more important part of the advertising economy. Um, I'll pause there. Anything else I missed? Any other platforms that people want to throw out there or ask questions about? Anyone on the line awesome. want to raise their hand? Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay. Cool. So getting into the cross-channel evaluation, right? How can you actually measure or uh, potentially choose between these different channels? You got to standardize it. Uh, you got to say you can compare apples to apples and not apples to, you know, tomatoes, right? Um, before you spend a dollar on any advertising, you should know your CPM, and I'll get into what that is in a second, and your expected revenue, right? Your impressions and your conversions, your top of funnel metrics and your bottom of funnel metrics. Without these, you are shooting in the dark. Um, you can't always nail these, but you can do your best to try to understand them and understand what the expected result is before you spend advertising dollars. Uh, as we talked about impressions, right? They're good for brand and everything that exists on the internet can be boiled down to a CPM. And a CPM is a cost per melee or cost per thousand impressions. Um, hand raise, Leslie. Oh, awesome. I think, yeah, I think, I think we're good. We're good. Okay. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry, y'all. My screen is very tiny because I'm presenting in the conference room. Okay, yeah, we're good. Um, I just asked Katie Connolly to do a test with raising her hand and make sure I could see everybody. So, uh, Hi, Katie, Katie did, did you want to say? Hold on. I think she's good. Okay. Um, so getting back to it, CPM, right? So the standard kind of equation here is CPM times the quality of the ad or the quality of the impression equals the value to your business. Um, again, CPM, cost per melee or cost per thousand impressions. Every impression, whether it's an ad or not out there, has a cost per impression. Uh, and the quality really depends on your business and your audience, right? I think, again, if you're working with that perfect fit influencer, the quality is going to be really, really high. If you're spamming Google banner ads out there, the quality is going to be very low, um, but the CPM is also going to be very low, right? So um, kind of giving a quality score as you're looking at a potential piece of media can help you make a decision. And just remember that 11 plus impressions are sometimes needed. So don't be afraid to get multiple lower quality impressions out there as part of your advertising strategy. Um, on the flip side of impressions, conversions, right? Those are, impressions are good for the brand, conversions are good for the business. You want to actually sell stuff. Um, and what I mean by that is the quality impressions yield traffic traffic to your site, traffic to your social media pages, whatever it may be, uh, which yields sessions and ultimately sales. Um, and that comes back to, you know, my golden e-commerce formula, which is sessions times conversion rate times average order value equals revenue. Um, a lot of advertising, right, is really just dealing with this first prong sessions, but conversion rate and AOV, um, those are maybe topics for another day uh, and another webinar. Um, Here's my CPM cheat sheet. So as we're thinking about CPM and thinking about, is it a good CPM? Should I be spending here, right? Again, it's all an open market with regard to advertising, um, but here are kind of some targets that you can use if you're evaluating what is the right amount to spend on a piece of media. Um, display ads, right? Very abundant, very cheap, 75 cent CPM. Search, maybe a dollar to $5. 
shopping three to seven dollars, video ten to thirty five dollars, which is a big range, and then sponsored content, um, usually fifteen dollars and up. Um, again, these are targets, these are ranges, but this can kind of be a nice barometer to say, okay, I just talked to an influencer, I've and we'll get to how to um, establish the CPM in a second. But it comes back and it's sixty dollars per thousand impressions, right? You're you're kind of way off. Cool. <clears throat> All right, so getting into this exercise, um, we're gonna go through the exercise of evaluating a media buy with a YouTube influencer. So um, the question, should I pay this influencer to advertise my brand? Um, I made this girl up, we're gonna call her Hannah Banana. Okay, Hannah Banana is a YouTube influencer. She has 250,000 subscribers on YouTube um, and her channel perfectly aligns with your target audience. She is like the person that you would want to work with. And you finally gotten in touch with her people. Um, and you're excited. You can see that she gets about 500,000 views per video in all of her videos in the last 365 days. And that includes sponsored videos and non-sponsored videos. She is proposing $20,000 for three product focused videos directing to your website over the next 60 days. Um, and that's the information that they have given you. And now you're probably thinking to yourself, should I do this? How, how do I evaluate it? That's what we're gonna get into right now. Cool, should you do it? So first, setting your goal, right? Is it impressions or conversions? If you're the early brand, you're the young brand and you're willing to invest, impressions you know, may be a little bit more important to you. If you're a more established brand and you want to simply sell, 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 um, conversions may be a little bit more of the emphasis. And so we'll, we'll actually talk about how to evaluate both sides of this. Um, but what you wanna do at the beginning is just back into what you're going to get before you make, make a decision on spending. What are you gonna get from this person? If it's those three videos at 500,000 views per video, you know you're gonna get a million and a half impressions. So step one, calculate your CPM. Here's how we're gonna do it, all right? She said it was gonna cost $20,000 to work with her. We're gonna get those thousand impressions and divide that by the 1.5 million impressions that are gonna come from those three videos. So basically the cost and the impressions are the uh, variables here. That yields a $13.66 CPM. Um, so as you're dealing with potential influencers or potential partners here, right? The important question to ask them is how many impressions does your typical media get if it's not YouTube and you can't see it, right? They should be willing to provide you with the typical results from previous campaigns or previous brands that they've worked with maybe. Um, arriving at this CPM is just gonna standardize this across a wide range of potential media options that you have. And so without a approximate CPM, again, you're kind of shooting in the dark. Pretty good CPM, right? We established that it's going to cost maybe $15 or more typically to work with an influencer. So I would be excited if I saw a $13 CPM from a potential influencer. Second part of this, right? Projecting your results. You want to know, again, if all goes according to plan, what's going to be the impact on my business? Not just impressions, but even potential sales. Um, so you have that 1.5 million impressions times a half percent click rate. I put in half a percent here. Obviously, again, you might be able to ask whoever you're purchasing this from, what's the typical click-through rate? What's the typical engagement rate with you know, previous activations that you've done? Um, so in this case, in this kind of scenario, it might yield 7,500 sessions to your website. And if you're you know, a savvy e-commerce operator, you know that those 75 100 impressions times a 4% conversion rate. I put 4% here because this is going to be super high intent traffic who is really excited about buying because they just watched Hannah Banana's video times my $75 AOV or whatever it may be. I'm using $75 as a placeholder here, right? Equals $22,500 in revenue. If I'm now thinking, okay, I just spent $20,000 to make $22,000 on a ROAS perspective, I did not necessarily come out on top. It's like 105%, right? 110%. Um, but on the flip side of that, I just got 100 or 1.5 million impressions for my brand. There's a ton of value in that. If I'm a growing brand, I can probably justify the cost to now say that some of those folks have gotten one or more of those 11 needed impressions to actually come recognize my brand and buy from it. Um, 
so again, all that together tells me that I need to know my CPM and know my projected revenue from a media buy, from an influencer buy before I sign up. Um, and I would not be comfortable as a marketer um, stroking a check without having a pretty good idea of those two things prior to it. Any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so at least for YouTube, it's very public on the results, but like when you get into Instagram, a lot of the influencers, if you will, um, they state their follower count versus their engagement rate or how many people are viewing their stories. So how do you, do you just ask for that information or do you I would. Back okay. yeah. I would, I would say, yeah, show me the results from a previous, you know, give me a case study, give me a, the last time you did this, or just show me a screenshot of, you know, the last five stories you posted. Um, again, if they're not willing to do that, my sense is they're either being extremely private or they're trying to simply guess at what their value is. Um, yeah. And you're not going to be able to necessarily achieve the results without knowing that information ahead of time. Okay. You can use, there, there's sorry. tools. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. There are some tools out there to help um, get engagement rates from um, influencers. There's a tool, it's a company actually based in Atlanta called Sidekick, spelled S-I-D-E-Q-I-K. Um, there's a few others as well that will actually, in addition to showing you influencers, in, you know, um, using the term influencer lightly, uh, social media accounts, right? Their, their number of followers, their typical engagement rates, um, the number of times they post, their sort of brand friendliness, right? Are they G rated or X rated in terms of their content? Um, so that can also help you kind of evaluate if they're not willing to simply tell you, uh, any of those metrics. Okay. Any other questions? Awesome. Okay. Questions? <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Um, well, you may think of questions. I am here. I am part of the Atlanta Westside Salt Fox community. Um, so knock on my door if you have a question. Uh, if you ever want to just chat through a scenario or a, yeah. They just want to have a couple more actually. Just asking the question okay. twice triggered a bunch of thoughts. Yeah, nothing to do with Putting the word on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> that sound feel <laughs> Uh, in the background? Yeah. yeah. All right. I literally, yeah. I, I was going to conclude the call with saying, Michael, can you share us That's where so you're true. sitting right now? Yeah, yeah that, that was, was I'm sitting the whole time like, what yeah. the hell? If you know, you know. Yeah. 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 That was the first thing I noticed. I, yeah. I, I know where that is. Like, really important question. That was it. Is that what you were going to ask? That was not what I was going to ask. No, I asked you if it was Bigger Bang. Oh, right, 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 right. Bigger Bang? Uh, a bigger bang theory or big bang. Big bang. Oh, yeah. I don't you can tell I, I just don't, don't, don't watch it. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, Michael, sorry. Going back, like, what would you say would be a baseline toolkit for a brand that at all times they have to have these three things running? Like, is it Google search? Is it Google? ads is it like the, the ecosystem is so big but if you were to just say like here's the three or four things that at a minimum you always should be doing what would those yep. be yeah i with 80 percent confidence because it is different for every business um google search and google shopping as well as some form of facebook and or instagram ad would be the three um and again um, not going against what I've said, but you can gain 
brand impressions without advertising. You can do it through your own social. You can do it through PR efforts. You can do it through word of mouth. But those three that I just listed, shopping, search, and Facebook slash Instagram, um, those are e-commerce focused ad ads, right? Those are going to actually drive traffic and intent to purchase to your site. Um, so that's where I would, if I had to choose, probably spend my money. In terms of uh, like, are there any long games out there in terms of uh, marketing where you can spend money that on the surface doesn't really return, but in, 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 you know, 60, 90 days, it's like, boom, is there any things out there like that, that, that not apparent to us right now? Um, I would even go longer than 60 and 90 days. I think 60 to 90 days may be, I would call that like medium term, right? But in, in the mm -hmm. medium term, I think again, um, thinking about ways to get folks exposed to your brand and exposed to your website, if you can get them to come to your site even once, then you've kind of got them, right? What I mean by that mm -hmm. is you can start actually doing the retargeting, the email drip campaigns, these other types of um, uh, ads and campaigns once they're in the ecosystem. Um, so maybe it's, you know, running a giveaway on your site, trying to get people to just simply type in your URL or click on something to get, uh, so you can start to kind of get them in the ecosystem, get them in the funnel. Um, in the much longer term, again, this wasn't intended to be all about influencers, but something that we did really well was we invested in small and up and coming influencers. And it was almost like uh, fielding a minor league baseball team that we just needed one of these folks to kind of blow up uh, in order for it to work for us. And so we would, you know, quote unquote, sponsor um, these kind of up and coming YouTube influencers or Instagram influencers with just free product or even giving them a discount code on our site that they could share with their audience. Right. Um, and as they start to grow in followers and fame, um, you've already built a relationship with them. Right. Okay. Thanks. You had a question? No, I forgot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All righty. Um, well, thanks, Michael. Um, as as he mentioned, he's he's a member here. What's your office number? Fourteen. Do you know? Fourteen. So he's on 14. the on the back side. Yep. Um, and, you know, if you'd like a copy of this presentation or any of the formulas or his, you know, budget tracker, just um, you can find him on Slack if you're in Atlanta. And if you're in Dallas, then um, you can reach out to me and I can connect y'all. He's here. Is he here now? He's literally. So I'm right. Please go slide into the Yeah, that was him. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, God. That's a perfect gift to end on. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. for coming.